Hello, my name is Miss Kilburn Bond, and in this video I'm going to be talking to you about the poem Bayonet Charge by Ted Hughes. The objectives for the video are to help you to read and understand the events and themes in the poem Bayonet Charge, so that's AO1 in terms of assessment objective 1 for the exam, to explore and analyse the effect of language, form and structure in the poem, so more than just understanding what the poem is about, but being able to pick apart, put under a microscope, some of the language, the structure, the way the poem's been organised, so you can really talk about what the writer is achieving, how and the impact of that on us as the reader, and then find Finally, AO3 Assessment Objective 3 to explore the contextual factors and how these might help us understand the poem's meaning. So what can we find out about the poet, about the time at which the poet's writing or writing about that's going to help us be able to understand that poem even more. So let's meet the poet first of all. This is Ted Hughes. He has written many poems, very famous poet. If you're enjoying poetry, then it might be worth going to read some of his other poems. He wrote the poem Bayonet Charge in the late 1950s, but he set the poem in the First World War, which happened between 1914 and 1918. Now, Ted Hughes himself wasn't a soldier in the First World War, but his father had served in that conflict. He himself, Ted Hughes, grew up during the Second World War, so he is a poet who did have experience of world wars and how they impacted on the people around him, even though he hadn't fought in one himself. So it's thought that the poem Bayonet Charge is a result of him thinking about his dad and his role in the war, and obviously as somebody growing up at that time, the experience of war, people talking about war, people reflecting on whether those wars actually achieved anything would have been quite important to his thoughts and feelings. So he's put a lot of that experience and those ideas into the poem. He isn't a war poet, but someone called Dennis Walder described him in this way, which I find quite helpful when I'm thinking about this poem. He's a war poet at one remove, writing out of the impact of memory, the individual memory of his father and the collective memory of English culture. So what that's getting you to think about is whilst he might not have been a soldier himself, his personal life experience was definitely impacted by war from the memory of his father and his father's behaviour following being a First World War soldier, from the experience of growing up in the Second World War and watching what war can do to culture, to society, to family, and also the collective memory of English culture, meaning that life and people's expectations and behaviour and thoughts and feelings were profoundly changed by the world wars and he grew up in a time where he was part of a society that would have been looking back and analysing how to avoid those wars happening again and what they actually meant. And what happened after the First World War is as the war developed, initially people thought the war was going to be very short and that isn't what happened that bitterness started to creep in to society. So whereas originally there would have been a lot of almost excitement for war, it would have been seen as something that would have been quick and would have resulted in a quick victory, people hoped, that actually didn't happen. And the war became engrossed in a lot of bitterness and death. And therefore, even afterwards, even now, people still look back and talk about the impact of the war and how terrible it was for those soldiers who ended up dragged into it. Amongst the first to volunteer in September 1914 was Dick Barron, a junior travel agent with Thomas Cook in London. You can't imagine the war fever in those days. A patriotic war fever. I mean, we were at school told the, the thin red line. And, uh, the soldiers were very, very uh, spectacular creatures. And how they fought in the Crimea and uh, won the wonderful charge of the Light Brigade. It was all very romantic. And that's a really important idea, this idea of patriotism. So being patriotic, having or expressing devotion to and vigorous support for one's country. So really believing that you put your country above yourself, that your country is everything about your identity and is therefore worth fighting for. And that links to that word patriotism, the feeling of loving your country more than any other and being enormously proud of it. So those three 
posters that you can see would have been recruitment posters from the First World War and this is what society would have had surrounding them. Soldiers joining up for that war would have felt like this was something that they should feel patriotic about. In the poem Bayonet Charge what we're going to see Ted Hughes do is tell the story of one soldier who's initial patriotism who might have once seen these posters and believed in what they were saying suddenly all of that falls away and what he's left with is just a terrifying violent moment and in case you're not clear what a bayonet charge might be what you can see on the screen now is at the top a picture of a bayonet which is the blade that's at the end of the rifle and then the other pictures are of soldiers who are in the middle of a bayonet charge. So that would normally be a moment where soldiers were sent over the top, so out of the trench and sent to attack enemy lines. And they would be obviously in a hugely dangerous situation. So if you want to read more about the statistics around bayonet charges and how dangerous they were, there's plenty of that available. But all you really need to know to understand the poem is this was a particularly vulnerable moment for any soldier. So they'd be sent up into rifle fire, there'd be explosions going off around them, and they would be running directly towards the enemy, the enemy line, with this rifle and a knife at the end of it. So they're extremely vulnerable, really terrifying situation in which many of the men in each bayonet charge would be killed. So what you should now have is the context of the poem. Some information about the poet and some information about what a bayonet charge actually is. And then this idea of patriotism that explains why we might have a soldier in a poem experiencing what we're about to read. So with that in mind, let's have a read of the poem. Once I've finished reading it, what I always say is never read a poem once. You never get the best out of a poem if you just read it once and then try and crack on with some writing or questions about it. You need to read the poem several times, slowly let the words wash into you, think about what they mean, and each time you read it you'll find that you feel happier with what it's about. Bayonet Charge by Ted Hughes Suddenly he awoke and was running, raw, in raw seemed hot khaki, his sweat heavy, stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge that dazzled with rifle fire. Hearing bullets smacking the belly out of the air, he lugged a rifle numb as a smashed arm. The patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. In bewilderment then, he almost stopped. In what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing that second? He was running like a man who has jumped up in the dark and runs listening between his footfalls for the reason of his still running and his foot hung like statuary in mid-stride. Then the shot slashed furrows, threw up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, its mouth wide, open, silent, its eyes standing out. He plunged past with his bayonet toward the green hedge, king, honour, human dignity, etc., dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm to get out of that blue, crackling air, his terrors touchy dynamite. Now we're going to go through the poem in chronological order, starting with the title. You need to make sure that you've got your a copy of the poem to hand, highlighters, pencil, so you can be pausing and making notes around your poem. So let's start with the title. Your titles aren't there by accident. Poets think carefully about how they want their title to frame the meaning of the poem. And the title Bayonet Charge doesn't do anything cryptic or difficult. It's simply gives us a sense of this being a setting that we can then, through other clues in the poem, link to the First World War. So we've got this very clear conflict setting of the bayonet charge and what that might mean. And the poem itself has got no strict poetic form, it's written in free verse, so there's no set rhyme. And that can reflect perhaps the disorder of the situation that Ted Hughes is describing. He chooses a third person narrator and that narrator's omniscient, which means that the narrator can see what that soldier is thinking and feeling as he's entering that bayonet charge. And that gives us a detached view of the soldier. It's like we're looking down, watching him from a distance 
and that adds to the tension in the poem. We see this soldier totally alone. There's at no point in the poem are the other soldiers around him described. And it's like we're watching this one individual who's alone with his thoughts and his terror as he runs into that bayonet charge. We're never told who the soldier is. We don't know who he's fighting for, which country he's representing. And that's clever because it makes him universal. This isn't a poem about the British experience of war or the German experience of war. This is a poem that's universal, that could just represent war and any soldier anywhere. The poem is just simply condemning war generally. And the fact that it was published in the late 50s makes that make sense, if we like. It doesn't matter if we're not absolutely labelling this to the First World War in some ways. So remembering Ted Hughes coming from that post-war culture, he's trying to make sense of the senselessness of the First World War and the Second World War that have affected his life experience. So here we are with stanza one, and one of the clever things about this poem is that we're suddenly thrown into the action. There's no setting, there's no kind of slow introduction to what's happening. We even start with that word, suddenly. He awoke and was running. So as the reader, just like the soldier, we are thrown straight into this sudden chaos, this sudden movement. This technique's called in media res. It means any text, a poem, or it could be in a prose narrative, where we're suddenly thrown into the centre of what's happening. It's like we don't see the build-up, we're immediately there in the crisis of the moment. So suddenly, he awoke and was running. Now, whether he's awoken from sleep or if he's woken into a reality from a dream, it doesn't really matter. The imagery is the same, that one minute things were very different to this sudden terror and danger of the bayonet charge. And the idea that he's exiting a dream and entering reality is reflected in what happens throughout the poem. So we have this soldier who suddenly everything about his experience has been totally transformed. He awoke and was running and that running action that verb really different to the idea of being asleep of being in a dream so he really is being thrown into urgent immediate dangerous action suddenly he awoke and was running raw in raw seamed hot khaki his sweat heavy so hopefully you'll have noticed that alliteration there with the raw raw and the repetition in raw seamed hot khaki, his sweat heavy, and you might also be picking up on the sibilance, the repeated S sound that then continues with the stumbling, and then we've also got that in the across and the clods, that sibilance there. So what these sounds are doing is they're giving this poem a really claustrophobic feel. We've also got consonants, so this idea of lots of sounds within the words are all being repeated all the time, stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge. So we've got the D and the S repeated a lot in those images and that H beforehand. So all of these sounds are giving this moment in the poem this frightening, claustrophobic, strained Feeling, and that reflects this soldier who is sweating in his uncomfortable uniform. It's uncomfortable, it's like the seams of the uniform are rubbing against him when they haven't even been finished properly. He is physically uncomfortable, he's physically in pain, he's also terrified. He's sweating, this is really difficult work. He's confused, he's disorientated, and the sound of the poem reflects all of these things. He's running across difficult terrain, a field of clods, so that kind of muddy field that would make it very difficult to run anyway, let alone carrying your rifle, your bayonet, and wearing that uncomfortable uniform. So stumbling, someone who's stumbling is no longer sprinting in a way that makes you feel confident about their chance of getting to the other side. He's a vulnerable person at this point. Stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge dazzled with rifle fire. Now there's a lot of sensory imagery in this poem so you can see already sensory imagery being any of the five senses but here we've got sound and sight really playing an important part here and all of that sensory overload of the battle is being forced into this first stanza so Ted Hughes is surrounding us as the poet just as the soldiers surrounded by the sounds of battle and the sight of battle. So we've got the dazzled rifle fire. 
not just the sound of it, but we've got the impact on, on the light. Then we've got the sound of the bullets that are smacking the belly out of the air. So this is linking to the violence of that sound. So we've got smashing the belly out of the air. He lugged a rifle numb as a smashed arm. Now we could say this is a bit of foreshadowing, a smashed arm obviously reminding us of the potential for him to be injured. We've also got this idea that his rifle's become almost part of him, it's like a third arm. And it's like this soldier is almost not a person, he's a sort of machine. And that's certainly how, as we go through the poem, that's how he's been treated by the authorities, by his country. He's just part of a bigger machine. He's become a weapon, if you like, and is no longer an individual. And this terrifying situation leads to a change emotionally. The patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye, so notice the past tense there, where he once had a patriotic tear, where he'd once kind of cried for his country, where he'd once bought into this idea of that he was doing the right thing for his country, that's gone and it's been replaced by a different type of liquid. His tear has turned into the sweat and that sweat is coming like molten iron from the centre of his chest. So brilliant simile there, sweating like molten iron. Now that's again obviously a violent image. It's making us perhaps think about foreshadowing his death. It's certainly suggesting extreme pain. This soldier is absolutely in the deadly reality of what's happening to him. Emotional fantasy of patriotism has gone and what we're left with is panic and confusion and disorder and chaos and fear and violence and we reach that final line of the first stanza and that becomes really obvious to us. So the second stanza, something slightly different starts to happen here. So we've still got this soldier, he's still running in his bayonet charge, but emotionally things start to change. In bewilderment then, he almost stopped. Now he doesn't stop, but that caesura at the end of that line reflects the shift that emotionally it's like he has an out-of-body experience, if you like, where he's still running physically, but in terms of what he's thinking, it's like he has stopped and he starts to realise the reality of his situation. It's like time stands still and we are, as the reader, inside the soldier's psyche as that time stands still. And this is the question that he asks questions often reflecting this idea of someone who's confused, who doesn't have the answers. In what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing that second? So what this soldier is asking is, what has happened? Is it fate, the stars? Is it nations? Is it politics? What is it that has meant that in this absolute moment in time, in this second, that he is just the hand in this clock, a cold clockwork, a machine that seems totally unfeeling and uncaring. He's not being protected by fate, he's not being protected by his country. Instead, he's confused as to how this is happening to him. How has he ended up being nothing more than the hands of the clock, this powerless victim of a much bigger machine of war. Really clever metaphor that you need to think through so that you could talk about the impact of that on his emotional psyche. He's still running though. Whilst he's having this big epiphany, we could call it a sort of life-changing moment, a thought that's going to change everything about him, he's still running. He was running like a man who has jumped up in the dark the idea, the simile of being like a man who's jumped up in the dark, the senses have been dulled. He can no longer see the darkness is metaphorical in that it's like the darkness of his thoughts. His senses have been totally dulled. So he runs listening between his footfalls for the reason of his still running. There's an absolute lack of purpose now, a lack of understanding. He's realised in this stanza that this war that he once signed up for out of patriotism, out of something that he thought was noble and beautiful and romantic, he realises that it is totally senseless, that it's a hollow concept, that actually it doesn't mean anything. The bottom line is he's just this clock hand, this cog in the machine, 
that nobody is seemingly caring about. And as he's running, it's like he's listening for a reason in between his footfalls. Really sad image of a man who suddenly realises that he's likely to die and it doesn't really matter to anyone. And we've got some good alliteration here through the runs and the reason and the still running. And this helps us with the sound of the fact that even whilst he's having these thoughts, he's still running. And again, we've got enjambement, which is also linking to this idea that this is a man who even having these massively deep life-changing thoughts is having to keep running, otherwise his chances of survival are even more slim. So listening between his footfalls for the reason of his still running and his foot hung like statuary in mid-stride. So we've got this breathless running that we've seen through the enjambment, through the alliteration, and then we have this image of his foot suddenly hanging like statuary, like a statue, like it's suddenly frozen, if you like, in midair. So this whole moment is so important, it's so life-changing, that Ted Hughes gives us this image that is like he freezes in midair, but he can't afford to do anything about this moment, it's too late, he has to carry on. So then we have that word, then, then the shot slashed furrows, and war takes over and suddenly something else happens that means he can no longer afford to think these things, he has to keep running even faster. And that takes us through that enjambment into the third stanza where we're going to find out what happens with those shot slashed furrows. So we've got this really agricultural imagery. Ted Hughes wrote a lot about um, the countryside, a lot of the soldiers who would have found themselves in the middle of a bayonet charge would have come from an agricultural background, just young rural boys who ended up fighting. So this imagery itself is quite clever. So what those shot slashed furrows throw up is this yellow hair. Threw up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, its mouth wide, open silent, its eyes standing out. It's not a very pleasant image. If we take it literally, what happens is this hare, the animal, is so shocked and disturbed by the warfare around it, by this conflict, that it's literally thrown up out of the ground and its wide mouth, its silence, its eyes standing out kind of reflect this senselessness of the hair where it can't make sense of what's happening. It's absolutely stunned and shocked, in pain because of the conflict around its natural world has been totally destroyed by the human war that's happening around where it should naturally live. We could also look at this metaphorically and there are lots of different readings of this part of the poem. If we did look at it Metaphorically, we could think about the colour yellow as being linked to cowardice. We could think about it being linked to gas attacks in the First World War. In some ways, it doesn't matter what you end up deciding that yellow hair represents. The point is that there's no other human in this poem. The only other living thing that's mentioned is this hair. And this hair, like the soldier, has got this sense of confusion and not really understanding what's going on and being absolutely vulnerable in this moment. But the soldier can't do anything about the hare, the soldier just has to keep running and this is a theme throughout the poem, no matter what happens around him he just has to keep running and now we've got the plosive alliteration of plunged past, he plunged past with his bayonet toward the green hedge. Colours are only used a couple of times in a poem and one example is the yellow hair, the other example is the green hedge that's mentioned twice and that idea of the natural world in which these people are fighting does seem to have some importance in the poem, that it's this natural world that we usually associate with colour and beauty that's become the backdrop for this violence and senselessness. So he plunged past with his bayonet toward the green hedge, king, honour, human dignity, etc dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm. I think this is one of my favourite images in the poem. So we've got a list here and that idea of it being a list is important. It's a list of romanticised notions. It's a list of things that are traditionally seen as being quite important and honourable and noble and romantic. King, so royalty, honour, that human behaviour of honouring each other, of deserving honour from other people human dignity, so hugely important idea there. And then we get this word etc. 
that you might write at the end of a shopping list. And that's an example of bathos. It's an example of Ted Hughes deliberately being a bit flippant here because all these really important, noble, romantic notions end with the word etc. There isn't even time to list any more of them. And what that does is it shows how in this moment, these concepts that the soldier once held dear, they are in fact pointless. There's not even time, they're not even important enough to finish listing. They're hollow notions that in the middle of a chaotic, violent, deadly battle can't even be entertained. There's no time to even care about them. And this is what his epiphany in the middle of the poem led him to realise. So what this list of noble romantic notions do is they drop like luxuries. So brilliant simile there to show that they are luxuries, they are not important for his survival as a human and so therefore as he's plunging and running across this battleground they drop from him and instead we get this image of him in a yelling alarm, this sort of animalistic cry that reflects the fear and the true terror of the moment that he's in. Those indulgences of king honour, human dignity, they mean nothing when you're screaming in fear and terror, running with your bayonet in the middle of a battleground. So drop like luxuries and a yelling alarm to get out of that blue crackling air, his terror's touchy dynamite. So at the end of the poem, we still have this soldier in this horrific reality and the action and the violence of war. We've got back to that sensory imagery with the blue crackling air. And then we have this idea, so we've got onomatopoeia there with crackling, so that's sound imagery. And then we end with this alliteration of his terrors, touchy dynamite, the consonants there with the T at the end of dynamite too. And that creates a jumpy, nervy sound, which reflects exactly how this soldier's been feeling. His terrors, touchy, dynamite. His nerves have been stretched to the limit. And that sound in the poem in that last line reflects that too. So this soldier in this moment is totally isolated. He's isolated from other people. He's isolated from those that are controlling the war. He's isolated by his epiphany, by his emotional realisation that he's likely to die and become nothing more than just another statistic. And that ending the poem with that word dynamite, the dynamite was kind of metaphorically lit at the start of the poem, that first word, suddenly he awoke and was running and it's been almost kind of fizzing throughout the poem and we get the sense that as we are left at the end of the poem, we're heading for that explosion. The poem stops with that explosive word dynamite. Everything stops. The terror of the soldier might explode at the slightest touch and we've reached that point at the end of the poem. So we don't get any resolution at all. Just like at the start of the poem, we were thrown into the action. At the end of the poem, we're taken out of it when the poem stops, but not with any sense that things are going to work out for this soldier. So let's think about how all those things we've talked about might help you make comparisons with other poems in the anthology. There are plenty of poems that you can make links with. This is not an exhaustive list. I've just chosen some that I think quite obviously make some good links. So if we start with London by Blake, we've got two poets here exploring a sense of despair about the feeling of being powerless, about those who abuse power, and that could make a really interesting comparison about the idea of those who are vulnerable to it. In Prelude by Wordsworth, we've got both poems having this epiphany moment in which a character, something happens to that character where they realise their powerlessness, within society. So both London and Prelude, they might not seem to have an obvious link, they're not war poems, but actually the ideas in those poems would make really nice comparisons. Charge of the Light Brigade by Tennyson, really different in tone and attitude, but both have got this theme of patriotism at their core. They just do something very different with the situation of soldiers charging towards their death, but how we celebrate or how we use that as a protest, if you like, is really different in both poems. Exposure by Owen, we've got two World War I poems here, one written by an actual soldier in the war, one written by Ted Hughes looking back on a time he didn't actually have direct involvement in, but they present a really similar image of the reality of conflict on the individual, the hopelessness of war for those soldiers who were involved in it. 
Remains by Armitage, we've got two poems looking at the inner conflict and the damaging impact of war on the individual psyche, and War Photographer by Duffy, both poets there portraying a character who's experiencing the disappointment of realising that their sacrifices are ignored, their idealism, why they thought they were doing something and all the noble reasons, the reality is very different. And then Kamikaze by Garland, there's that shared exploration of the notion of patriotism as a deadly reality. So really interesting list of poems there that you could practice making those comparisons with. And that brings us to the end of this video about Bayonet Charge by Ted Hughes. So hopefully you've got a sense of having read the poem, you understand the events and the main themes. Hopefully you feel that you could pick out some of those language techniques, say something about the form and the structure of the poem and analyse how that adds to the meaning. And then finally we've got some contextual factors that help us understand why Ted Hughes might have written the poem at the time he did and why he might have explored some of those themes. I really hope that's been helpful in helping you enjoy this poem.